Father, your word says that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. You know exactly whose steps you ordered here today. We thank you so much that we're able to gather together to worship you and to honor you with our hearts and minds. But Lord, I know that you don't force anything upon anybody. And so there you are at the door of our heart, just knocking and waiting for us to open up and let you in. And so I pray that we do that this morning, Lord. I pray that you would illuminate your word, Lord, that as we dive into it and we want to learn more about you, who you are, have a relationship with you, Father. Lord, that your word just jumps off the pages into our own life and we learn how to apply it and be obedient to it. Father, I pray that you would anoint me from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet, that you would completely get me out of the way. And Father, that I would die to self so that you may be glorified. Lord, let everything I do and say and deliver be honoring and glorifying to you in every way. I thank you for what you're doing in our life. I thank you for what you're doing with Rooted Right Ministries and for all those that came to join us this morning. I pray that they leave here blessed, healed, set free, and delivered. And more importantly, Lord, I pray that they get to truly know who you are, my personal Lord and Savior, Jesus. And Lord, you're no respecter of persons, and what you've done for me, you will do for anyone. And so I pray that they feel your love, first of all. I pray that they feel your forgiveness, and I pray that they feel a peace that surpasses all understanding. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. We're going to hope this, uh, we're going to hope this mic works. We're going to pray that it works. I'm actually going to go a little bit. I get too close, I'll have to go back. Well, I was preparing for the service this week and uh, I had praise and worship music on. I just realized that I'm a gospel guy, which is kind of funny, but the church that we were a huge part of in Tampa, had the greatest choir you could ever imagine. I mean, we probably had 70 people in the choir and the sound was just heavenly. And so as I was praising God and getting ready for this sermon, I just started laughing at myself. So that's why we have guest uh, praise and worship leaders every single week right now, but I'm praying and believing God uh, for a praise and worship leader to come to Rooted Right Ministries. And I pray that you guys would join in with me and believe that. It's not working too good. Okay. I may have to. That's better. Maybe it just needs to be closer. I guess I'll hold it this week. All right. So as I was preparing this week, the title of this message is called Making Room for God. Our signature scripture comes from 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. For those of you that have brought your Bibles, I do encourage you to do that. I realize that lots of Bibles are on your phone, and I, I have that. I'm blessed by that every single day. Uh, make sure that you don't allow yourself to read texts or check some Instagram or whatever other social media is out there. Give this time, at least this one hour, over to God and see what he has for you. And so 2 Corinthians, we're going to start. This talks about Paul, and it's talking about a thorn in his flesh. Verse 7, it starts, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. A little different than the message we get in the world that we live in today. Let's first start talking about thorns. We need to identify what a thorn looks like in your life. We, when I first say the word thorn, you probably think of we've all had a splinter or a needle that has pricked our skin. We've had a 
uh, sliver in our finger or in our foot or somewhere else in our body that is constantly nagging us. Maybe some of you fishermen in here are fisher, uh, people that love fishing have gotten a hook stuck in various places. I know our family has quite a few stories about that and not always just in hands or, uh, you know, and, and we have some, yeah, we'll pass on that, those stories right now. I am not a good fisherman, but we have some great fishermen in our family. A thorn is something that nags or irritates your life on a consistent basis. You can't seem to shake it. It keeps showing back up. Like it says in verse seven, something that troubles me, something that torments me, something that gets on my very last nerve. Anything coming to your mind right now? Hopefully those of you who are married, you're not thinking about your spouse right now. The Bible never tells us what Paul's thorn actually is. And that is so you can put your thorn in that place and relate to what Paul was facing. Some theologians say that Paul may have had poor eyesight. Others speculated that it, he may have been lonely. But since the term messenger is used, it is highly possible that a person was being used by the enemy to irritate him. Remember, if it is a person, the person is not the thorn. He or she is simply the vehicle through which God allows the thorn to come. We're going to change your mindset about your thorns in your life today. Whatever the case, the principle remains the same. The thorn is something that God gives or allows that causes pain for an intended spiritual purpose. Have you ever thought about your thorn as God allowing it for an intended spiritual purpose? There are many different types of thorns in our lives. We have emotional thorns. This can be in the form of depression, regret, pain, guilt, and a common one in the world we live in today, bitterness. We have relational thorns. This type, this type of thorns we often see in marriages, but it's not limited to that. It's when personalities, quirks, decisions, or preferences get on your nerves and you are simply annoyed by them. About financial thorns, taking a long time to find a job, not finding the right job, having a job you don't like and you're not passionate about. It looks like you're climbing out of debt and you're finally getting into a better spot financially and then something else comes on your radar screen or something else breaks down. How about a physical thorn? That's been all too prevalent in our face for the last couple of years. We have health issues, disabilities, chronic illness, headaches that won't go away, low energy, cancer, physical pain, or any number of other kinds of ailments. Thorns can come in all shapes and sizes, yet regardless of their magnitude or sharpness, a thorn always hurts. The second principle to apply when dealing with thorns in our lives is to recognize them as a gift. Say what? Yeah, I'll repeat that. The second principle to apply when dealing with thorns in our lives is to recognize them as a gift. I know that's not making sense. The Apostle Paul claimed in verse 7, there was given me a thorn in my flesh. All right, now we're getting crazy. You can't make this stuff up. You're supposed to now look. God not only gave Paul a thorn, he also let the enemy deliver it. I was with a group of men on Friday, and I'm so blessed to have them in my life as we gather every Friday morning for Bible study. And it's amazing, as I was listening to one of the guys in the group, there's a tremendous amount of things going on and tough, tough stuff. Family issues, children issues, car issues, job issues. We were going through a whole list of things, right? And I thought to myself, and I, I, I was being sarcastic, which we shouldn't be, but when I delivered this, because it's hard to even say it. But one of our other guys brought up James 1, 2, that says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. 
When was the last time you actually praised God while you were telling somebody else in your life, a family member, a friend, hopefully another man or woman of God? When was the last time you actually praised God for a trial, for persecutions, for a thorn in your life? And I'm talking about actually mean it. Because even while I was explaining it, could you imagine going in there? Yeah, I hit a deer with my car and my other car broke down and we were a three car family and now we're a one car family. And praise God, I know that God's going to do. I'm, I'm talking about really believing. Like, I'm not just talking, this isn't just pie in the sky. Like, I'm just talking it just to be the positive thinker and to say something that sounds good. I'm talking about actually having faith that God's got this all under control and he's going to use this situation in my life for his purpose. When was the last time we actually looked at our thorns as a blessing? We oftentimes put God in a box and all we hear about, and many times all we preach about, is that God blesses us, God prospers us, and God expands our borders with favor. By the way, that's all true. Those are the amazing blessings and promises of God. God does do that, but he's interested in, in developing us along the way like clay on the potter's wheel. This next statement I'm about to make really hit me. And I want you to think about this and really let it sink in. One of the worst things that could happen to a person is to arrive at his or her destiny, arrive at their moment in life and not be, and, and to be too spiritually immature to live it out fully or to have the effect on others that God intended you to have. If we are not spiritually mature to handle the blessings of God, it can be wasted or not maximized. So I started thinking about the blessings of God in my life early on. I was a great athlete. I was blessed. I had amazing opportunities. I signed to be a professional baseball player right out of high school. I believed in God, but by no means was I using my gift and talent to glorify God. And so here's what happened. I worked hard every day, grinding away like many of you. You have goals. The Bible says clearly that delight yourself in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. So God knows your heart. God knows your goals. God knows what you've been pursuing and trying to make happen in your life. And so I was grinding away in the minor leagues. And it took me six years to finally get to the big leagues. And I thought, I'm finally getting what I'm deserving. I'm finally getting all that hard work is finally paying off. And so I was playing in the Sky Dome against the Indians. And I got a base hit that day. And I was player of the game. And the crowd was going wild. And I went up on the Jumbotron and I got interviewed afterwards. And then I went back to my hotel room in the Sky Dome. I went up to my hotel room. I watched myself on ESPN. That was pretty cool, right? And I walked around into the bathroom in the Sky Dome. And I looked at myself in the mirror and tears just started flowing down my eyes. Something that I had not only been working for for six years in the minor leagues, grinding away every single day, the ups and downs, the hurt and pain, the time at the ball field, the time in the workout, putting in extra work, grinding, 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 the pressure. I thought it would be fulfilling. And I'm looking at myself in the mirror after being player of the game and thinking, this is going to feel good. And tears are flowing down my eyes, realizing that something was still missing inside of me. And when I read this, this, this statement, which I'm going to read again, because I want you to think about your own life. What I realized when I read that statement is I wasn't ready to glorify God in A with the opportunity that he just gave me. And in fact, do you know if sometimes if you get what you think you want, that it actually can take you out? So I may have been ready to play at a big league level from a physical standpoint, maybe from a mental standpoint, but there were some things going on outside of baseball in my life that would have taken me down. And so the higher you go, the brighter the lights, right? And so the more that you see God opening up new opportunities and blessings coming your way, there's more people watching and it will come out what you do in secret. And so I didn't realize it at the time, but God was actually protecting me. 
through this thing. Yet I was complaining that it didn't happen sooner. Lord, why, why can't I get, why can't I have this? Why can't I have that? Why haven't, why hasn't this happened in my life yet? And I was so focused on what, what was it wasn't happening. And you really didn't realize how God was protecting you until way after your career, that if you had given me what I wanted, I may have just lost my reputation, my family, and all that I thought was dear to my heart. I'm not going to go into my testimony. We'll have a chance to do that another time. Let me read it to you again, though. One of the worst things that could happen to a person is to arrive at his or her destiny, arrive at their moment, and to be too spiritually immature to live it out fully <clears throat> or have the effect on others. Don't miss that part. Sometimes you make it just all about us or to have the effect on others that God intended you to have. If we're not spiritually mature enough to handle the blessings of God, it can be wasted or not maximized. God wants to use you. This is new revelation for me in, what the, in the way the word of God reminds us that God will take everything that the enemy meant for bad, everything. So now we're thinking about thorns too. God will take everything that the enemy meant for bad and turn it around for his good. Do you believe that today? Do you really believe that? And take a look back over your life and watch how God was protecting you. God was molding you. God was shaping you. God was watching over you, even if you didn't give him the praise, honor, and glory through it. I pray that going forward today, we will realize and see how God is molding and shaping us through all of these lessons. It does say that in Genesis 50 and 20, by the way, if any of you want to write that, that God will take everything that the enemy meant for bad and turn it around for his good. The road to a blessing and victory is often littered with life lessons and your faith being developed. What are the lessons for? To strengthen your character, to cultivate your virtues, to deepen your love so that when you receive God's blessing, you won't squander them and you will know the purpose behind them. It's pretty amazing when God brings something, some provision that you've been praying for and you know exactly what it's for. But you can just go ahead and look all in the media. Go ahead and look in any area of life that you really admire somebody that's accomplished something. And when they get to a certain place where they're just piling up, piling up, piling up gift after gift after gift after gift, and they have no idea what to do with it. I think that's one of the saddest states that we can get in as Christians. And because we're believing God for a lot of things, we're praying for a lot of things. We can watch God <clears throat> bring those things come to pass and know why. How do you know you're facing a thorn? Because it won't go away. In verse eight of our signature scripture, we read that Paul says, concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. Did anyone else catch that? He prayed only three times about this. Anybody else pray, pray a little more than three times about something? Anybody pray about the thorn that may be in your mind right now a little more than three times? It must be nice to be such a powerful man of God that he realized after praying to God just three times, it must have been that something God was allowing. That's a shift in a mindset for many of us, and it sure is an eye-opener for me. Many of us are trying to get rid of something God himself gave us. And just like Paul, God wants you to rely on him in your, in, for his strength. Next time you go to God in prayer about your thorn, ask God, what is your hand in this? What are you trying to reveal to me? And what do you want me to learn? So as I was sitting there with the men, when you start to get a godly perspective and a spiritual perspective, you also start to listen to people differently. You start to ask while they're saying, while they're talking, and sometimes instead of you jumping on and saying, oh, yeah, that's terrible, I don't know what's going on, and, and just diving a wedge further and further between you and God, you start to listen to the underlying thing in some of these things that are being said. And once you know it, in the midst of all the struggles that this one gentleman was going through, he quickly went through it when I asked, 
how's your daughter doing with her faith level? She's only 19 years old. And he said this, and he's one of my best friends. He said this. He said, I can't believe she's in the choir at, um, uh, she's in a Christian choir in college. She's got a, a as good or better relationship with the Lord than I do, 19 years old. And he just marvels at her strength to be able to get through the things that she's dealing with on a daily basis. And so the dad is actually drawing strength from his daughter. And, his, his, and I just stopped him. I said, did you hear what you just said? Your daughter at 19 years old is maybe even in a better spot than you are at in your mid 40s. And you're drawing strength and faith from even watching her go through what she's going through with the attitude that she is. And I'm not saying there's not up and downs. As a 19 year old, you can imagine. There's, not, there's a lot of ups and downs, but she's staying strong. And so as we listen to ourselves, and that's why it's so important to share your testimony. See, we are to bear one another's burdens. So while he was sharing that, I don't know if he would have caught what a blessing that was. And then how he can switch that thinking and being thankful to God in the midst of all this craziness and all around him, that he can actually wake up and count it all pure joy that you're facing this. And you're making room for God in every area, in your faith, in your trust, in your belief, and in who God puts in your life. Because all of us in that room had something to share with our friend and our brother. And we're learning the power of that. One of the reasons God gives you a thorn is that he wants, you to, he wants to show you something new. My life is completely brand new in less than two years' time. And so I know this all too well. He wants you to show, that, show you that his way are, ways are higher than your ways, and his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Like Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Far too many people spend their time complaining about the thorns and trying to cover up the pain with distractions, rather than asking the Lord what he wants to teach us that will take us to a higher level of spiritual maturity. If someone asked you right now, what is your spiritual maturity level at? What would your answer be? And by the way, you don't have to forfeit yourself in any way because the Bible says God is only looking for childlike faith and trust in the Lord. So you can start that spiritual maturity today. A thorn can also be used to keeping us from exalting ourselves or for taking the credit, or for thinking, God, we got this. We can take it from here, God. Remember, Paul said in verse 7, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in my flesh. A third reason God may allow a thorn is to address an actual sin or potential sin in our lives. Hebrews 12, 8 through 11 says this. It's talking about discipline. If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who, has, who have disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of Spirit and, life and live? They disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. That word trained reminds me of why we love that scripture that it says, train up our children in the ways of the Lord so that they will, when they get older, they will not depart from him. God may be addressing something that we may have not seen or been willing to repent from without the thorn that we're dealing with. And finally, we're going to talk about what the response to the thorn should be. Rather than complaining about the thorn that irritates you, take it to the Lord in prayer. We saw that's what Paul did. 
and ask if he will remove it. If he does remove it, seek God's wisdom. If he does not remove it, seek God's wisdom about what he wants you to learn in the midst of it. Get God's perspective, spiritual guidance. Get a man or woman of God involved. If you're a man, get a man involved. If you're a woman, get a woman of God involved. Go search the word. Get a spiritual perspective on what you're dealing with. God didn't remove Paul's thorn, but he gave him a little bit of insight in verse 9. My grace is sufficient enough for you, for power is perfected in weakness. The translation, I'm not going to grant you your request in the way that you think I should. However, I will meet your need. Here's a promise from God's word. And by the way, God can't go against his word. So this is great to hear this promise. <clears throat> the promise is that if God does not take your thorn away, he will supply sufficient grace for you to handle it. Second Corinthians 9, 8 says, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance. You may have an abundance for every good deed. Praise the Lord. God wants to do something greater in your life that will overshadow, that will overtake, and will pale in comparison to the thorn. I think that's another one of the great revelations I got while studying this. Sometimes we spend so much time focusing on the negative, on the thorn in our lives that we're completely missing what God is either going to use that for or something actually new that he has for us that would act like that didn't even exist anymore. And if I was had time to share my testimony, you would hear that. I had so much focus in one area in my life that I had no idea what God was trying to do with me until I surrendered. And then this wasn't even an issue anymore. Because the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all of these things, all of these things that you think you want, all of these things that you think you're striving for, all of these things that you think you can't have, it's because we miss the seek ye first the kingdom. And then he adds those things unto you because it's not your focus. It's time to get a spiritual perspective from your creator. God wants to do something at such a superior level that you create that that you completely forget about the problem or you no longer view it as a problem. And maybe you're even thankful for it. We serve an Ephesians 3.20 God, a God that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ever ask or think, according to his power that works in us. It's not some magic potion. It works in us. So you have to let it work through you. So let's start making room for God. Let's start looking at our thorns in a little different way. You know, one of the best ways the enemy lies to you, it's almost completely opposite however he puts it in your heart, in your mind, however the world portrays it to you. And you're seeing this. Not too many people are going to think of a hardship or persecution or insults or difficulties in their lives as a blessing. Maybe that's the way you separate yourself, that you actually believe and you actually trust that God has this thing all under control. Do you know that nothing can happen to you that doesn't pass through the hands of an almighty and sovereign God? Do you believe that this morning? Sometimes you just actually get into, it may even be the first part. We haven't gotten to the prayer part. You know, when I asked my buddy, I said, hey, when you're going through all those things throughout the week, I said, is the first thing on your mind to get on your knees and go to prayer or to grab your spouse and say, honey, I don't know how this is going to work. I don't know how we're going to pay these bills. I don't know how this is going to work out with our kids. I don't, I don't know what's going on. Everything's going crazy all around us. We just need to get in front of the Lord and ask for his guidance, his leadership, his direction, his strength. I don't, I don't have any clue, but I need to go to the Lord. Is that the first thing you do? What do you think the answer was? So many times we don't, do what we even know to do already. And the Bible says to know to do good and not do it is even sin the more. And do we think of sin as not going to God with everything in prayer and supplication? I don't think so. I think we put sin in all of our categories, right? We got all the different, we got the big sins, we got even the little ones, but you're not doing that, so I'm doing good. But do we go to God with everything in prayer and supplication? Have we ever truly counted it all joy? When we're walking through persecutions. I'm going to end with this. I don't know if you can put this up, Luke. 
this picture that I gave you, maybe? If not, that's okay. I'll, I'll describe it. This kind of messed me up. So one of the great revelations this week was uh, God will take everything at the end of meant for bad and turn around for good. That, that became more real to me. I, that sounded good, but I could see now with this thorn message, I could see, all right, everything that I feel like is that I'd like to get rid of in my life, that God might actually be using that to mold and shape me and to proclaim his glory through it. And then the second revelation, uh, if you picture a thorn and you think about when you've been pricked or punctured, think about the first thing that comes on the scene after your skin has been punctured. And so with the, the title being Make Room for God and a picture of a thorn kind of would be a, an image of you kind of being punctured or having that sliver there. As you can imagine, the first thing on the scene is blood. Isn't it like God to show us that the minute hurt or pain or the minute separation of our skin, the first thing on the scene is blood to stand in the gap for you, to rely on Jesus and what he did on the cross for you. He shed his blood for you and I and the, for the forgiveness of all of our sins. Hallelujah. And so I sat looking at this picture and I thought, sure enough, the minute pain comes into our body, what's the first thing that we should be doing? And it's an actual visual for you. So every time you look down next time and I got a nice visual here that I could show you from CrossFit. But every time I look down at that hurt and pain and I see that scrape on my leg, reminds me that I need to get Jesus involved and I need to make room for God. The blood of Jesus is sufficient enough for all of us. His grace is sufficient enough for all of us. I pray today that we look at our thorns just a little differently than we did in the past. And I'm going to give us an opportunity and I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to just take over. And you can remain seated because this is a time for reflection. We often do this at Rooted Right Ministries. What I don't want to happen being part of this ministry, for those of you that have been coming, uh, you know this already, but some people might feel really uncomfortable coming to this church because one of the mandates that the Lord put on me is that whoever sits under the sound of my voice, which is me surrendering over to God, I'm not going to allow you to not grow. And that's not just me. That's my wife and the amazing team that we have already assembled. And every single one of you that's sitting in here, we're going to start holding each other accountable. And I find it Actually, God's got a sense of humor, and there's some people in this room that, that know this, but I didn't want to be held accountable for anything, especially over the last 10 years, and so I'm coming out with a book soon with uh, another pastor in, in Tampa who completely changed my life by making a call to me, and we've been on that call every morning for one hour for over 400 days, and my life has been completely restored in every single area. Like I said, we don't have time for um, to unpack the testimony, but I just find it that God's got a sense of humor that the guy that didn't want any accountability is now going to be known as the accountability guy. And that's just like God. So sometimes the things that you're pushing off or that you don't want or that bother you the most are actually the things that you're called to do. And so that may be another way to look at the thorn in your life that God's setting you up to help heal, to help speak to, to help minister to some of those things that are going through, going through the very same thing that you are. And so if you come to this church, we're going to hold each other accountable for what we're hearing. We're not just going to be hearers of the word. We're going to be doers of the word. And we're going to do it out of truth and love. The one thing that Pastor Clarence, who you hear me talk about all the time, did, he always spoke the truth, but he spoke it out of love. He wasn't persecuting me. He wasn't judging me. He was a signpost pointing back to the word and seeing what the word of God says about it. 
And so some people may come to these services and squirm and I can't wait to get out of here. I don't, I don't know if I want to apply that in my life. I don't know if I want anybody asking me about that. It's just a lie from the enemy. And so I pray today that you see that and that many times it's the exact opposite of what you think. And when you actually start sharing what's going on in your life, the Bible says we're overcomers by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And God has given each and every one of you a testimony. But he's got much bigger plans than you could ever imagine. By the way, don't try and figure God out. Every time I think I got a good idea for God, the way it comes into my life is completely different than I ever could have imagined. You just put it into God's hands. So we're going to take this last song as a time of reflection on what we've spoken about today, the thorns in our life. And I'm going to pray before we go in into that song. Father, we love you so much. You are such an amazing God. Lord, thank you for a revelation this morning. Holy Spirit, I know that you're the one that does all the talking. So maybe it was something I said or something I read from your word. And Lord, your word could not come back void. But many people in this room have recognized a thorn that they've been dealing with for a long, long time. And Father, maybe for the first time, we're going to ask you while we're sitting here reflecting, what is your hand in all of this? Why, Lord? How are you going to get the glory? And we're going to stop trying to do it on our own, come up with our own good ideas, or try and figure it out. We're truly going to trust. We're truly going to have faith that you got this thing all worked out. And we're going to get ourselves out of here. Father, as you minister to us, please wrap your loving arms around us. That even as you're molding and shaping us and convicting us and sometimes in us, any love that we've ever felt here on earth from a human just pales in comparison to how much you love us. You know every hair numbered on our head. You know us so much better than we even know ourselves. And so we just ask for you to reveal some things in our lives. And Father, I just pray right now that you would minister to each and every person in here, both individually and corporately as a church. I thank you for all those that came here today to share in your word and to move forward in our relationship with you, Jesus.